Hi, and welcome back to this series. We're making good progress. We added MongoDB in the last video. We added our event model, and we're now able to actually hit the database when we get an incoming mutation or when we want to retrieve our events. Now, let's also make sure we add users to the picture so that we get closer to our final API implementation. So we need more models now. We want to have users and users should be able to book events. So in the models folder here, I will add a user JS file because obviously we want to um, define how a user should look like in our application. And there, just as in the last video, I will start by importing mongoose. Then I will um, access this schema object or this schema constructor provided by Mongoose because I want to create a new user schema here. Now, as you learned in the last video, we do call new on that schema constructor and pass a JavaScript object to it. And there we now define how this object should look like. So how a user object should look like in our app and in our database. Now, my users will be very simple. You can, could add tons of data there, the address, mobile phone number, I will give my users an email. And that should then uh, be of type string and it should be required. And my users will have a password, of course, and that will also be of type string. And this will also be required. Now, that is not all, however. Of course, my users should be connected to the events. And actually, there are two ways how users are connected to events. Either they created an event. So in our app, we want to enable users to create events, something like your birthday party, or maybe something else, if it costs money. The other way we connect users and events is, of course, by bookings that a user booked an event. Now, Let's focus on the bookings later for now. Let's add uh, another field here, which I'll name created events. So that is that um, connection where we say which user created which event. Now, created events will actually be an array. So here we will store an array of data because obviously a user can create more than one event. And in a mongoose world, we depict this relation by first of all, adding square brackets. And then in there, we define how a single element in that array of data would look like. So we have multiple created events, potentially at least. Each single uh, data field we store in that array will, however, be an object where the type is now not string, not number. It will instead be schema types object ID because we have this special object ID data type that Mongoose or that MongoDB uses for its IDs. And here we will just store a list of IDs in the end. Here we store all the IDs of the events this user created. Now, this is not strictly required. We can have an empty array. Um, when a user is brand new, the array will be empty. But if we add data, it should look like this. So the elements in there should simply be IDs. And by the way, this here, just to make this really clear, does not mean that we add objects to created events. We add um, instead data fields. We add our object IDs, our IDs here. So we will have multiple IDs in that array, multiple string-like objects. One special field I add here in the, de in the definition of how my data looks like is the ref field, however. This is important internally for Mongoose because this allows me to set up a relation and let Mongoose know that two models are related, which will later help us when we fetch data because then we can basically let Mongoose automatically merge data, which is really cool. Ref takes a string and now it's important. Here, we use the name of the model to which we want to connect this. So here we want to connect this to the event model. And in my event model file, I chose event as a name like this. So we should use that exact same name here with the same casing and so on. And now we're telling Mongoose that there is a connection so that we store object IDs in created events and that this will actually be object IDs from my event model. Otherwise, Mongoose couldn't tell because object IDs don't have metadata in them to which model they belong. 
So now we have this connection. Of course, we also want to set it up in the other model, in the event model. Every event should actually be created by a user. So here I will add a creator field. And now this will not be an array because every event will only have one creator. So here instead, this will be of type um, schema types object ID, just as in the other um, model. And I will also set up a reference here. And here the reference will of course point at my user model. Now I haven't given this model any name yet because I haven't called Mongoose model yet, but I will name this user eventually. So I will use that name here. And now of course in the user JS file, when I create that mon model with Mongoose model, I should make sure that I name it user like this here too. And there I will point at my user schema. And just as before, I wanna export this. So I will call or I will set module exports equal to that model. Now we created a user model and that is now actually connected to our events. Now I'll quickly go back, by the way, into my collection view, or if you don't have that, into MongoDB Compass. And there you can clean up data. I'll quickly refresh to see all the events I created. Since these don't have a creator, I will actually delete them here uh, to make sure that I don't have invalid data in my database. So let's get rid of all of that. And now go back to our code because adding this model is a nice first step. We'll work on the booking later. Now let's of course make sure that we actually are able to create new users and that we actually also add the user ID to a newly created event and that we then add the event ID to the user. So let's get there step by step, go back to app.js and let's tweak our GraphQL schema and we'll outsource this into a separate file eventually, by the way. There we now don't just have events, we also have a new type, the user type, right? A user will also have an ID, underscore ID to be precise, will have an email, which will be a required, a non-nullable string, and will have a password. And now the password will actually be nullable. So I won't add an exclamation mark here because we'll not always um, guarantee that a password is set. Because when we fetch user data, I never want to return that password. You should never be able to access that password. We'll need it when we create a user, but we will not be able to ever retrieve it from the database. So in my resolver, I will make sure that I don't return the password. Therefore, this is actually nullable. Now, of course, we also can create users. So I will add a new input data type and I'll name it user input. And when I create a user, there I will have an email which is non-nullable and a password. And here the password will also be non-nullable because when I create a user or when I try to log in a user, I need that password. So if it's passed in from the outside, from the front end, I absolutely want it, but I will never return it. So therefore here, I got this user input type. Now we obviously need the fitting queries and mutations. So let's start with the create user mutation. You can name it however you want. I will name it create user. And there I will have my user input and it will return the user object to kind of give, the, uh, give an idea of which user was created. This is it for now. Let's now go down to the resolvers and there after create event, I will add the create user resolver. Now, just as before, this will get my arguments, so my user input in this case, and now I can add logic to create a user in the database. For this, let's first of all import that user model by requiring it from slash models user. And down there, when I create that user, I now will create a user object with new user there I need to set an email and a password. Obviously when storing it in the database, we need a password. So I will access args user input, just as I did it with args event input up there. And then there should be an email input because that is how I defined it in my GraphQL schema. There in user input, I defined that there would be an email and a password. Now we are accessing the email. Now let's go down and let's do the same for the password. So here I will also add password arcs user input dot password 
And this would be a huge security flaw already. Now, do you see what's wrong with this way of storing the user data in the database? Well, if we store it like this, then we would store the password as plain text in the database. And no matter if we use SSL encryption for transmitting the data to the server, at this point of time, it would be plain text and it would end up as plain text in the database. And if anyone ever hacks our database or some employee who doesn't like us has access to the database, then our user passwords are exposed as plain text and we absolutely don't want to have that. So we should create a hashed password, which can't be decrypted basically. For that, I will quit my development server and I will install a new package, which is called bcrypt.js. And this gives us some cryptographic methods that help us creating a hash, which we can later also compare to an incoming password to see if the incoming password is correct, but which we can't uh, build back, so which we can't uh, get the original password from. So with that installed, I can restart my development server. And now here I will actually import bcrypt by requiring bcrypt.js here. And now we can use that down there in create user. And we'll do that before I create the user object. I will call bcrypt. And then there is this hash method. And hash takes as a first argument the string we want to hash. So in my case, the password. rx user input password. And the second argument is, is the salt. Now this is basically, this defines the security of the generated hash and 12 rounds of salting are considered safe. Now this gives us a promise because this actually is an asynchronous task. It could uh, fail for some reason. In this case, I want to throw an error and it could also succeed of course. And in this case, I will have my hashed password and I then want to use that here. And now I will create that user inside of this then block once I have the hashed password and I will store that hashed password in the database. Now, since this is an asynchronous task and we are in the resolver, we want GraphQL or Express GraphQL to wait for us. So I will return this so that Express GraphQL knows that we got a asynchronous operation and it should basically go into that promise chain and wait for uh, it to be resolved. And now we are on a good uh, road to save our users. But we're not there yet. We create that user object, but we don't save it to the database. So we want to call save here. And this returns this promise like object, which we can also return in here. So that in the next then block, we actually now have the result of this operation or an error, which will be handled by catch still. And in there, I now have the result of this operation. This is now the created user. So here, I can now return just as before, result underscore doc, and also um, override the ID to be result ID using that virtual getter provided by Mongoose. Now let's give this a try. I have create user in place here, should work. I have my schema definition updated. Let's go back to graphical and there let's create a new mutation. And uh, you need to re reload that page to have uh, correct auto completion again. So now I have create user here as an option. I can pass my user input and there I have my email, for example, test at test.com. And I also want to have my password here, tester. And then I want to return something and let's actually try to get both the email and the password. If I now hit enter, this generally looks good. We were able to create our user, otherwise we would have gotten an error. We can also uh, check this in the database. If I refresh there in my collection view, I have the users collection now and there I have the user. We also see that the password is hashed but we also see that I'm able to retrieve the password. And yes, it's the hashed password and this is pretty secure, but I actually don't even want to retrieve it because where would you ever need that? It, it is useful for nothing and it still is even a tiny, but it is still a security issue. So I don't want to return my password here. And one easy fix is to go down there where I create my user and I will override the password 
and I will always set it to null. Not uh, the password which I'll store in the database, just the password which I retrieve thereafter. So now if I run that same query again, you see password is actually null. I'm not able to get this. It's now nullable. Or it was nullable before, but now I'm taking advantage of this. One other thing you might have noticed is that if I refresh my collection again, I now have two users with the same email address. And I don't want to have that in there as well. So what I will actually do first, before I even create my user, I will look for a user with this email address in my database. And I can use that user address and that user object. And there I can use find one to find one single user because if one user with that email address exists, it's already too many and there shouldn't be more than one, of course. I will add my filter criterion here between uh, curly braces and I'll look for the email address being equal to rx user input email. And then here I have my then and my catch block and let's ignore a catch for now because I will solve this differently anyways. But in the then block here, I get my user. And now the way Mongoose works is actually not such that if we make it into then, we have a user, and if we don't make it into there, we have no user. We will always end up in the then block unless we have a connection error or some permission error or any other error. But otherwise, we'll always end up there. And user either is undefined if there is no user that matches our filter, or it will be an object. And for us, this means that if user, if this is true-ish, which it would not be if it's undefined, and we are looking for the undefined case, of course, because we are looking for the case where there is no user. But if this is true-ish, which means there is a user, then we have a problem. And then I want to throw a new error where I say user exists already. Otherwise, if we make it past this if check, I know this user does not exist yet, so we can safely continue. And now I want to return bcrypt hash. I want to return this in this then block, and now I can chain my next then block onto this. So now we would continue with the other um, chain. If we throw this error, we skip all other then blocks, and we go right in there and return this error back to GraphQL. So now if I save that, Let's try that again. Exact same mutation with the existing email address. And now you see I get back null here in create user. Problem is, of course, that I don't return my uh, promise here and therefore Gra GraphQL finished too early or didn't wait for this promise chain to resolve. So let's add return and save again. And now I get an error. User exists already, which is what I want. And if I go back to my uh, collection view here in the database and I quickly clean up these uh, duplicate entries, so I clean up all my users for now here as well. If I do all of that, now we have no users in the database. Now I am able to run this again and I added this user to my collection because we had no user. Now if I reload, we will see that single user we just added, of, of course. But if I now rerun this, I would get this error again. And thereafter, if I refresh, we still only have one user because we didn't hit the database. Instead, we threw that error and we didn't continue. So that's great. We're now able to create users. We didn't really add a log in or anything like that. We'll do this later. The last thing I want to do is I want to be able to connect my created events with a user. And for that, in my models, I already prepared something. I have that creator field on the event, for example, where, where I want to store the object ID of the user who created the event. Now, later, once we added authentication, we'll be able to retrieve that object ID automatically um, because we'll basically add a header to our requests to pass that on. And we'll take care about this later. For now, I will use a, a simpler approach I will copy my object ID, so this string here is enough, um, of the user, which I will now use as a dummy user for all created events. And again, we will change this later. And in app.js, when we create an event, I will attach this to the created event. So here on the event I'm creating, I will now add the creator field because that is the name I assigned in my schema. And there I now want to store 
the ID of the user. And again, I will hard code this for now. And the cool thing with, with Mongoose is, I can just pass a string there and Mongoose will automatically convert this to an object ID, which we ultimately need. You need to store an object ID so that MongoDB can work with it, but Mongoose does this conversion for us. So we can just pass a string here. And now we will save that user as the creator of this event. If you remember, however, in our user model, we also have the created events key. So once we created the event, I also want to add an entry to the user to make clear, hey, this user has these events which were created by the user. And therefore, now I will go back to app.js. Once I call save and I have my event stored, I will actually not return a response or a result for the resolver immediately. Instead here, I now want to edit my user. And for that, I will call user find by ID and I'll find that user with the for now hard coded ID. And I will return this here so that I can simply add a new then block here. And there I will have my user. Now, of course, we could somehow have a case where we don't find a user for that ID. So if that is the case, I will actually throw an error, but that is very unlikely. And it won't happen here because I hard code the ID of a user who does exist. But if we make it past the if check, we know a user exists. And now we can simply edit the created events. So this field, we can simply edit this on the user and call push there. And this is a method provided by Mongoose. And there we pass the event. So our event object there. Or just the ID of the event, that is enough too. We could pass both. Mongoose is able to handle both. If we pass the whole object, Mongoose will pull out the ID. If we pass just the ID, it's fine anyways. So here I will just pass the entire event object, which I'm creating up here. And this has to be an object based on a Mongoose model, which it is. So now I pass this whole event object. And thereafter, I will return user save here so that I access the database and, and update the user. This will now not create a new user. It will update the existing user. And therefore, we add one other then block here. There I got the result of this operation. And now I want to return. What do I return? Well, still an event, right? And now we have a problem. If I copy my old return statement, there I returned result doc and so on, but the doc is now actually the user document of the updated user. So if I want to return the created event there, I need to do this uh, in a different way. And I will do it in a very simple way. Um, I will create a new variable created event up there, which is initially undefined. But once I have my event created, which is the case in this then block, I will actually set created event equal to what I previously returned here, like this. Oops, created event should be the name, of course. So I will set created event equal to that. And then down there, once I added my user, I will just return that created event here. Now let's give this a try. Let's save that. Let's go back to graphical and let's create a new mutation here. The create event mutation with the event input. And there we want to have a title, testing, a description. This is a test, a price of course, 9.99. And we need the good old date again, where I will again generate it with the help of the developer tools here. This is my date string I want to use. Let's close that. Let's insert it here. And then for the created event, I want to get my title and I want to get my description. And I get user exists already. So that threw an error. Well, the message is wrong anyways. And of course the check is wrong. I should check for the opposite if we don't have a user. And then I should return user not found, uh, my bad. Uh, just copying that was, of course, uh, not enough. I have to check the opposite because here the problem is if I don't have a user, not if I have a user. So let's try it again. This looks better now. Now, here I actually created that event. And if I now go into my events collection, we will see this worked. And I actually have two events here simply because um, previously 
I um, messed up because of my error, so I will re remove one of these events. And by the way, if you want to handle such a case where you have like two operations on the database that kind of work together, you could use a transaction. Maybe I'll add that later. Uh, MongoDB supports transactions since version four. I do cover them in my course. Uh, for now, don't want to dive too deep into MongoDB, so let's leave it like this. This error is fixed anyways. Now we have one event here, and that event has the creator. This is our user ID, and we ch can check the users. Always remember this uh, event ID, it ends with EB4. If I go to the users collection, you see there we have the created events array, and there we have an event. Okay, this is now the different event because I am um, actually deleted the wrong one of my duplicate events. Let's fix this, let's delete this event here real quick. Let's go back to users, and in this array we can edit this by clicking this um, pen icon. Let me delete this object ID in there. Update, now I removed that um, event from the user, and now if I simply create the event again, now we have a clean setup, and now you will see, if we go back to events real quick, here is our event with the user object ID, and it ends with ACA6, and if we go back to the users collection, we see under created events, there is this event ID. So now this connection between events and users also works. We are now able to create users and create events that are connected to users. And that's a huge step forward. Now obviously bookings are still missing, real authentication is still missing, so there still is work left to do. But we're making good progress and I hope I can welcome you back in the next part of this series.